calling open source roguelike. I've been working on the game for a few years now, and I'm here, what I'm here to talk about today is the things I've learned from working on the game during that time, more specifically about a certain way of thinking about game design that Crawls taught me. So, think about a game system, a way that the player can interact with a game. Uh, forget whatever the intended purpose of the system is, how it's supposed to be used, and think, if a player has a bottomless supp supply of patience and an infinite tolerance for tedium, how can they use this system to maximize their chances of winning the game? What does that play style look like? Does that seem like it would be fun? If not, you may have found a problem. So uh, this is simpler to understand with an example. So in Civilization II, pictured, you control a number of cities, each of which gathers various resources, production, food, research, from a subset of nearby tiles. Each of those resources fills up a bar to make a unit or to grow the city or to get a new technology. And when the bar fills, any excess resources are wasted. Um, the player is allowed to choose which tiles each uh, city gathers from with its limited population. And that's supposed to be so the player can temporarily focus their city on some specific goal, like, say, building a new defensive unit before the barbarians arrive. But what do you suppose a hypothetically optimal player might do with this system, someone who's doing everything they can to win? They're going to go over every city they have, dozens of cities eventually, and every turn for hundreds of turns, they're going to manually re reallocate their city's populations to make sure that no resources are being wasted after a bar fills up. This does produce a significant advantage for a player who's doing this over time. But it's a huge distraction from the sort of strategic and tactical decisions that <laughs> the game is supposed to be about. In fact, it's just make work. Later civilization games improve the situation considerably by the simple tweak of letting excess resources carry over into the next thing built, the next city growth, whatever. Um, it's not a perfect fix, since the hypothetically optimal player will be on the lookout in every city every turn to see if they can bump around their workers just enough to get uh, a bar exactly filled up um, to complete it one turn early. But the impact that has is much smaller. It is an improvement in the game. Uh, another example, here going back to Stone Soup. When Stone Soup, when it was released, had a pretty unusual experience system. You gained experience by killing monsters, that part is normal, but in addition to leveling up, your experience also went to improving your various skills, like you had your stealth skill, your greatsword skill, your divination skill. You didn't explicitly choose what skills your experience went into. This is the really interesting part. Instead, whenever you performed a related action, you swung a sword or you cast a spell, experience from your pool, the pool that you got from killing monsters, went into the related skill. That sounds kind of cool on the face of it. it to, your skills are based on what you actually do. To get better at swinging a sword, kill monsters by swinging swords. Awesome. Except, playing through the game straightforwardly, just without thinking about where your skills were going, gets you a sort of a haphazard mix. Not, it turns out this wasn't really optimal for winning. And so maybe, like, maybe if you wanted some more armor skill, what if you just like, sat in a corner for a few hundred turns while a harmless rat attacked you? Well, or Maybe you could train conjurations by casting magic dart at a wall over and over and over again. Was there anything stopping you from doing that? It turns out, no. So until that system was replaced with manual skill point allocation some years ago, people did all of those tremendously tedious, repetitive skill training exercises. Victory dancing, it was called. You, you could win without victory dancing, but your odds were a lot worse. And Crawl is and was not an easy game to begin with. So some people may be wondering, why is this a problem at all? If interacting with systems in this hypothetically optimal way is so tedious and unfun, surely players can just not play that way. It's a reasonable question. 
and there are games for which hypothetically optimal play is not a relevant concept. But for a game like Crawl, or a game like a lot of roguelikes, the existence of unfun hypothetically optimal play is a real problem, even if players don't actually engage in that kind of play. Obviously, if they do play that way, as they did with Victory Dancing, that's no fun. But even if they don't, players are going to die in Crawl. A lot. It's a hard game. And when they die, after they finish cursing and swearing, they're going to think, why did I die? Sometimes they're going to think, you know, oh, I should have started teleporting out of that fight as soon as I saw that dragon, not five turns later. Or, oh, if I had a potion of haste, I could have beaten Sigmund. Um, well, next time. And now they're already planning out their next game. That's a fun way to die. What's not fun is dying and having at the back of your mind the thought, Oh, if only I'd sat in a corner for several hundred turns to train fire magic. Then I would have had won that fight. If I'd cast detect monsters every other step, I'd never have had to fight that monster in the first place. If only. NetHack has something comparable called pudding farming. <laughs> Take the weakest weapon you can find, hit a pudding monster to make it split in half, and when you've gotten enough puddings, kill them and cash in their corpses for a bevy of divine rewards. Extremely useful, not fun. Many players ask the NetHack devs to do something about the problem, to which another player, Jove, memorably replied, the dev team has arranged an automatic and savage punishment for pudding farming. It is called pudding farming. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great line, but it's a terrible dev philosophy. A situation like pudding farming puts a game at war with itself, puts the fun way to play in conflict with the way that makes you most likely to win. It doesn't have to be that way. And for what it's worth, the NetHack devs seem to have agreed. They removed pudding corpses in the last release, the Miraculous 3.6, which seems to have more or less solved the problem. One assumption that I'm making here is that all roguelikes are about the same things that Crawl is, giving players an a series of interesting choices, a set of tactical and strategic challenges. For some games, this is less true. For example, Ivan is essentially a cruel prank on the player. <laughs> Dwarf Fortress's adventure mode is a story generating tool rather than a strategy game. There's not even any way to win. Um, tactical and strategic choices are less core to those games, and so to some extent they escape the need to worry about hypothetical optimal play. If the fun of the game comes from the game cheating to beat you, or if you can't win at all, what does optimal play even mean? What are you optimizing for? There are ways to improve your character in Dwarf Fortress that are like an insane cross between victory dancing and pudding farming. I've seen players suggest a training regimen that involves wrestling with a crab while arguing with a bard, and then every time the crab collapses from exhaustion, you take a break to dance. <laughs> and so this hilarious. It, but the thing is, actually playing it isn't that great. And you have to set up a bunch of macros. You waste a bunch of time. There's no actual like gameplay going on there. But in the end, you, aren't, you may be stronger, but you're no closer to winning. There's no winning. What does it matter? It's goofy. Still, the, <laughs> though there's no broad strategic goal, end goal in something like Dwarf Fortress's adventure mode, there are still battles, for example, which have tactical goals, and hypothetically optimal approaches to achieving those goals. Are those approaches fun? As long as you have clear goals for the player to achieve, Hypothetically, optimal play does remain a relevant concept. Even if it's not applicable to the whole game, it still can be applicable to parts. Uh, OK. But why do some games, like uh, traditional roguelikes, run into these sort of tri uh, hypothetically optimal problems all the time, but other types of games, like uh, still focused on clear goals, on winning or whatever, don't? One key reason is a lack of time pressure. In the game Crypt of the Necrodancer, enemies have specific movement and attack patterns. They're very de most of them are completely deterministic. For example, red dragons move one tile towards you every other turn, unless you move into the same row as them. 
and then they take exactly one turn to breathe in, and then breathe fire across the row on the turn after. The result of this is that there are specific patterns, uh, sequences of repeated movements and actions, that can let you defeat a dragon every time without taking damage without fail. That's hypothetically optimal play. And in more traditional roguelikes, this would be pretty annoying. Imagine doing a little dance for every one of the dozens of dragons you fight in a game of Dungeon Crawler, every one of the hundreds you fight in a game of Angban. There wouldn't be any challenge to it beyond the first few times, just rote repetition. But Crypt of the Necrodancer has time pressure. You only have about a second to take each move. That doesn't just add challenge to the actions involved, it fundamentally transforms them. Do, uh, successfully executing the maneuvers needed, the dragon slaying dance or the armadillo sidestep and so far, becomes satisfying in itself. And that's very generally applicable. In situations with real time constraints, like in Necrodancer or multiplayer FPSs or other popular games, situations that would be annoying without time constraints become entertaining challenges in themselves. Rogue type real time mechanics are pretty heretical for a roguelike but you don't necessarily have to go that far. The core problem that Necrodancer solves is the existence of actions without a cost, like actions like freely rearranging your tile workers in civilization. And there are often other ways to solve that problem. So in Dungeon Crawl, going back to this game for a moment, you can give your allies orders, like go here, attack that, run away. And if you were able to give those orders freely, the game would bog down to a crawl any time you had allies. Imagine micromanaging each of a dozen orcish minions or more for every turn of every battle. There are a lot of battles in crawl. But crawl has a cost for giving orders. Each order takes a turn, just like moving or attacking that turns unit management into a real tactical choice. Is it more important to order all of my orcs to focus fire on the wizard, or should I attack him myself? And it removes that hypothetically optimal problem. There are times when fixing hypothetically optimal behavior that's totally unreadable, involves harder trade-offs. In older versions of Crawl, monsters were able to pick up items from the ground and use them against the player. That could produce cool situations. When you fought an orc that spawned with a scimitar of distortion, you weren't just w thinking about how to kill her and keep her from banishing you to the abyss. You were also thinking about how to use maneuvering and positioning and tactics to keep her friends from just picking the scimitar right back up off her corpse. You, uh, more commonly, though, it also, uh, the mechanic also produced annoyances. After fights ended, optimally, what you would do is you would go around and pick up any potentially dangerous weapon and go toss it into some lava or toss it into a corner somewhere where monsters wouldn't pick it up and use it against you. That got kind of tedious. So how do you fix that? Our solution was more or less to remove the ability for monsters to pick up items. Probably that was the right call, since it's really hard for any tactical mechanic to be interesting enough to justify common annoyances like that, frequent annoyances. But that did mean we lost those interesting tactical situations I described earlier. Net improvement, but still some loss. But it's useful to consider the root cause of this monster item pickup problem. Why was monsters picking up items interesting while fighting enemies, but annoying afterward? Why was it optimal? to spend all that time hiding dangerous weapons away. The deeper problem is what I'm going to call the great sin of Crawl, and of all the old school roguelikes. These concepts of being in combat versus out of combat. It's not a formal distinction, it's not something in the game itself. It's just an emergent property. Sometimes enemies are nearby, and sometimes they aren't. But when enemies are nearby, every turn matters, and when they aren't, turns and actions become almost free. The meaninglessness of out of combat costs, out of combat time, produces endless problems. Various effects like buffs that enhance the player's combat ability or summoning spells that create temporary allies become hypothetically optimal to constantly ca recast and refresh while outside of combat, so they'll all already be active at the start of every fight you enter. Failure chances on abilities become irrelevant. You can just retry them until they succeed.
And it's very hard to restrict or balance systems for being in combat versus out of combat because there's no formal mechanical difference and there's a lot of blurry cases. Maybe there's an enemy right around the corner. Maybe he's about to wander into you. Maybe he's not. Where do you, where do you set the line? So one approach to fixing this is to say, okay, you can loiter around outside of combat all you want. You just won't get anything for it. Games like Doom RL, Sproggy Wood, and Desktop Dungeons solve the problem by removing health and magic regeneration over time. And that approach avoids many of the problems I mentioned. However, turning HP in, uh, MP into strategic resources by doing this creates new challenges. In Sproggy Wood, for example, killing enemies gives the player stamina, essentially MP, and if they have a vampiric weapon, HP. In some levels, spider pots uh, continuously spawn weak spider enemies. Uh, these enemies don't give the player XP, but they do give stamina, and if you have the vampiric weapon, HP. That means that sometimes it's a good idea to farm spiders until your resources are topped off, which is kind of boring. If you could just rest to regain HP, of course, there'd be no reason to do that. Similarly, Crawl has a race that doesn't regenerate HP over time, the Deep Dwarf. This race tends to be de dependent on various vampiric effects to get its uh, HP back. Um, and that's not a problem in itself. It's possible, however, to leave weak enemies in an earlier level to create a sort of vampire farm. Whenever you're badly injured, just go back, uh, suck some health out of, out of them, and then go back to adventuring while they regenerate. Uh, deep Dwarves are a powerful enough race that most players don't do this in practice. They're kind of overpowered, honestly. But it does speak to the difficulty of retrofitting this uh, a new regen over time design into a traditional roguelike. In general, removing health regeneration from roguelikes makes them less forgiving. Without the reset that resting between fights provides, it's much easier for bad play to accumulate and for death to come as a result of decisions made quite a while beforehand. If and as that makes death feel inevitable, like your character is already as good as dead and you're just going through the motions, it's not very fun. This tends to especially be the case in fuzzier game designs that assume the player is going to take a bit of damage in each fight, like in Crawl or Doom or L, unlike Sproggy Wood or Necrodancer. I personally quite like designs that remove regeneration over time, but it's not a cure-all. Another approach to fixing the in-combat versus out-of-combat uh, dichotomy is to try to make out-of-combat time meaningful by giving players a limited number of turns until the game ends. The most straightforward approach, a simple fixed time limit, like 4,000 turns until the game ends, win before then or die, suffers very badly from the good is dead problem that I mentioned a moment ago. Especially for new players, it's very easy to end up in a situation where you've actually lost a long time ago, but the game doesn't have the dignity to end itself until much later. <laughs> This problem is obvious enough that I'm not aware of any game that it's actually stumbled into it. Instead, starting with the original Rogue, most roguelikes have used a variant of the idea called a food clock. You start with some amount of food, which lasts for such and such a number of turns. You find more as you explore and you play the game, and you die if you run out. And this is basically like adding checkpoints to a simple clock. Uh, you die if you spend more than 1,000 turns before getting to dungeon level 2, or maybe 2,000 by dungeon level 3, or so on. In Rogue, this works. Out of combat time is meaningful, because every turn until you starve to death counts. It's a simple game, and the clock is tuned to be quite harsh. But losing directly because of a food clock isn't very fun, at least in part because even with the checkpoints, you still tend up, in, tend up in those good as dead situations. And so most later roguelikes made the food clock more lenient so that players would run into those situations less often. They also added other complexities. What if monsters could eat your food? What if you could eat monsters? <laughs> what, uh, what if abilities like spell casting or divine invocations used up food? Each change made food harder to balance and when in doubt, designers tended to err in the direction of a laxer clock. Even without 
the changes that directly interacted with food, the addition of different classes and play styles, some of which required more resting time or more uh, movement time or whatever than others, made it impossible to have a clock that was tight for the fastest play styles without being impossible for the slower ones. And as a result of all this, what you end up with in uh, roguelikes uh, like crawl is food as a sort of a weird vestigial stub. Um, capable of reigning in only the most ridiculously time-consuming strategies. When it comes to designing clocks to making out-of-combat time meaningful, food clocks are far from the end of the story. Crawl actually has at least three different kinds of clocks. Food, piety, out-of-depth spawning, and uh, more, if you, depending how you count it. But they're all quite flawed. There's a deeper reason for that. Crawl is simply too big. A winning game of Crawl covers many dozens of huge levels, and normal players use built-in automation to deal with this, automatically exploring levels, picking up items, traveling from place to place. The automation wastes time compared to an optimal human player. But since the clocks are weak, this doesn't matter. If time did matter, though, an optimal player, playing to maximize their chance of winning, would be encouraged to turn off all the automation and clear levels by hand. Which, in Crawl, once you've played it once or twice, that's not very fun. And so as a result, to avoid this, all of our clocks are kept weak and toothless, essentially. Which means that out of combat time remains practically free. Which means we keep running into these hypothetically optimal problems over and over again. So in the end, then, this is something of a cautionary tale. If you're building a roguelike, or really any game with a focus on strategic and tactical decision making, think about hypothetically optimal play as you do. Be wary of free actions. Consider how the game will act in and out of combat, or whether you can avoid an out of combat state entirely. And if you're going to build a huge, sprawling, old school roguelike like Crawl, good luck. <laughs> That's it. So we have time for some questions. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So the question was, do I think the scoring mechanic in Crawl helps alleviate the problem with the food mechanic and with the other clocks? And the way that scoring in Crawl works is that it's, um, well, there's sort of basically two different ways it works. Unle until you've beaten the game, then uh, scoring is just bas based on how far through it you've gotten, more or less. But uh, once you beat the game, um, Scoring is, goes exponentially higher, and it's based more or less on how fast you beat the game in terms of in-game turns, not real time. Um, and so if you're trying to optimize for that, then of course, uh, if you're trying to get the highest scores, you want to minimize the number of turns, which means, again, out of combat time does uh, count. There is an implicit clock. You just, instead of dying if you mess up, you just don't get a high score. Um, and so for the people who do speed runs of this, um, I, really either real time or uh, turn based, there are people who compete for both. Um, that does absolutely help. I've done it myself. It's a lot of fun. But the vast majority of players aren't doing this. The vast majority of players are just trying to win a game. The vast majority of players are just trying to get their first rune or maybe to get to the lair of beasts or whatever. Um, and for these players, um, and so for this, for this sort of play, um, Scoring doesn't help. People who are doing speed running, people who really care about scores is something more than a way to just track how far they've gone through the game. Um, they're always a very small minority, and it doesn't really make sense to design the game for them or to um, really do anything of that kind, which does result in some, oh, sorry. And, um, it does result in some weird things. There are some hypothetically optimal strategies optimal play strategies for speedrunning that are insane. Because of the peculiarities of the way scoring counts, it's per player action turns rather than per actual in-game time, which are different things. So you end up 
trying to take actions that take a long time while resting because that's fewer turns. So if you want to rest as fast as possible, you wield a loaf of bread and swing it around because that takes half again as long as... <laughs> but, yeah. And so that would be a real... And so actually that would, that would be a real problem in its own way if, um, if, we, if we were designing around speedrunning. But again, it's just such a small part of the player base that it doesn't make sense to um, make many assumptions about design based on it. So, so. Oh, um, so you were talking about checkpoints as food. Yeah. Could you just do hard turn checkpoints? I know yeah. Sill, for instance, does. You have to descend before a certain point, otherwise you were just forced to descend every time, and then you know you eventually get to floor twenty, and you either beat the game or you get killed by more dogs. Um, so the question was, uh, so whether you could have a clock that would just hard turn. Uh, checkpoints, just get to floor this by turn 500 flat out, or you die, or you lose, or whatever. Uh, oh, that was, was that Sill you said? Yeah. Oh, OK. I, um, yeah. Sill doesn't exactly work that way, as I understand it, but it doesn't matter. Um, the, um, I would say the answer is, in principle, yes, but you would have, it, I think that only really works in a simpler game, the idea of these. Ver, um, so first of all, I think you need to have the checkpoints be very close together, very short, because if, it's, um, if you realize you're moving too slowly 200 turns into a 500 turn checkpoint, and um, you uh, um, I think it's, uh, again, you have that uh, already dead problem, potentially. So I, um, and the other thing is, again, you have to have something where there's, where play style, there are relatively few pl similar play styles in terms of the time they take. You have to. Um, they would have to be very well balanced because otherwise, again, you end up with the situation where either um, some play styles aren't being constrained by the clock at all, really, or other play styles don't work. And um, yeah. Okay. Thank you all. It's a pleasure.